strategy of raising would you rather own a small piece of something huge or a big piece or everything of something much smaller um i don't think about it that like that wouldn't be the deciding criteria if if it was just between those two i would rather own the whole thing of a smaller of a smaller thing i find it to be uh, more fulfilling and i think economically you end up doing better you have more options because when you own a small piece of a bigger thing if it happens to go a little sideways and doesn't have big unicorn exit good doesn't go public doesn't get sold for three billion dollars uh it's very easy to kind of walk away with very little because you raised all this money so now you you have the first hundred million dollars go back to investors and maybe you only sold it for for 70 or something like that whereas you owned like a huge amount of the hustle i yeah. think that path is better because you could sell for 12 million dollars and walk away with ten million dollars, you know, like out of it, and so and so. I think it's a it gives you more options on how to build your wealth. Now that being said, there's something fun about building something massive and going for something that's like truly game changing with three extra zeros on the back of it. So like you know, I respect both paths. If if I was picking between those two, I would own. I would want to own more of a smaller thing because it gives me more options. What do you think is easier? Oh, for sure, owning uh, owning a small thing. Now, easier in one sense, which is it is easier, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis because you don't have to worry about fundraising, shareholders, other shareholder management, and you can, again, you can exit for smaller amounts. The harder part, when you go rate, like these guys just raised $75 million, they're not going to feel like they're like roughing it <laughs> every day. Whereas when it's your company and like, I don't know, you probably ran payroll for, you know, uh, the first well, year of the hustle. And um, and you probably had to worry, like, let's say, you know, advertisers pull out, you know, you probably were feeling that pinch because you were more or less bootstrapped. You raised a little bit of money, but like, right. I don't think you ever felt like, you know, you have this huge cash cush cushion that you can just fall back on. Well, yeah, I did not. But my opinion, I, I normally would have agreed with you. But well, we had Mark Laurie on the podcast and I talked a lot. I had a lot of his coworkers reach out to me after the podcast. And basically Mark Laurie's our judge.com. And what he's done is he, uh, he, what was his vision? He had his like, he had this like phrase and I forget the phrase, but it, it was like vision capital people. Is that what it was? Yeah. It, it, that's his, uh, his, his fun name now. So we can look it up. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's. Vision capital people. Yeah, you got it right. VCP. Vision. And so he like, that was his whole premise. He's like everything. I come up with the vision. I get the capital. We get the people. That's what we do. And when he says that, I'm like, that, like, what does that mean? Like, that's a pretty like vague, fluffy thing. But I started talking to people who worked with them and they're like, he did that so well where he would raise all this money. And he really like, he did a lot of work, but it wasn't like, it, he wasn't like doing like, 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 like you know, the shit that you do when you're just starting out when you don't have any money, you know, uh, uh, you're, like I, I ran my own payroll. I did all the banking. I did, uh, you know, I would yep. go out and get all the vendors. He was like, he just like hired amazing people and they did most of the work. And he just took care of the hard part of like selling people to uh, join the company and selling people to give them money. And I thought about that. I'm like, dude, that does sound so awesome. easy. Yeah. It sounds pretty <laughs> well, it's awesome. It's not that it's easy. It's awesome. That's how I'd put it. Nothing's easy. Anything, anything valuable is typically, you don't go to it because it's easy necessarily. But um, I, I, I'm totally with you. I, what's, what's more fun, a small vision or a big vision? A big vision, right? What, what's, uh, what feels better, having a lot of ammo in, you know, in terms of capital or being strapped for cash and always not only having to worry about how to get customers and grow, but can we pay the bills every single month? Yeah, but definitely. On the other side, if Sean wants to fuck off for a little while, you can do that. Yes, you know, exactly. You, you, could, you, could, you can bail so, for a so little. So I optimize for freedom. I optimize for freedom above, above most things. And so like, if you ask me, would I rather work? My, my dad taught me this a long time ago. He told me once because my first startup was a sushi restaurant chain. And I was like, I was talking about, you know, why it's fun, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, he was trying to convince me to come work in the energy industry. He's like, he, he worked at BP. So he worked in the oil and gas industry and he's like, he's like, you know, the minimum is like you like to play poker, right? Now, when you go to a poker table, you can either sit down with $100 or you can sit down with $10,000 or $100,000. You're still playing the same game. You're still going to sit there for six hours. He's like, it's why not play the bigger game? And he's like, in the energy industry, the minimum stakes are in the millions. Nothing happens in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like you're saying a, a restaurant, one location, if it works can produce $100,000 a year of net income or $125,000 of net income. He's like, 
Why not just, he's like a small project and a big project. If you make it your, your obsession, which is what you're going to do when you go start a startup, they both take the same amount of time. They're both going to be all consuming. All right. So might as well do the one that has the bigger payoff. So when he said it like that, I was pretty sure like, that's why my next start, I, I stopped the food thing and I went and did a biotech company because he was right in biotech. Like our, we made one deal that it was worth $5 million. And I was like, wow, that would have taken us like five years and 25 locations to do in the restaurant industry. And this was like one, one great meeting, one great presentation and like, you know, a year of technology development and boom, $5 million came through the door. So I kind of got to taste both sides of it. And so if I was gonna, a big project and a small project both take the same time, a big project's more fun. But what I don't like is big companies because in big companies, I feel like I lose my freedom of my time and my energy of how I want to spend my day. And so that's why I'm trying to find this mix of uh, my perfect situation is I work for myself and pretty much by myself but I'm working on things that I feel are big and can pay off big. And the, with the world of the internet, that's now possible. One of the most expensive mistakes I ever made. So Trends now makes millions of dollars in subscription revenue. It's a really good business. Had we made relatively minor changes, like not that different. Like it wouldn't have cost us more money. We maybe would have had a few more people. We, and we right now we charge three hundred dollars a year. There's a world where it wouldn't have had to been that much different, and it definitely would have been a similar amount of work. We could have charged thirty thousand a year, right? And I didn't understand <laughs> that for a long time. Now I completely do. Where it's like, it's well, I actually, remember we were talking about that with HustleCon when you were doing HustleCon. The HustleCon ticket was what, two, like two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, something like that. Yeah, on average. And you had told me, because I was like, dude, why are you doing this like events business? You're like, dude, events businesses can be big. Look at this one. Look at that one. And I went and looked at him because you were right. They did actually like make tens of millions of dollars. But I was like, dude, the ticket price of this is three grand minimum. And it looks like they have a $15,000 ticket package for like some people. Yours is like 10 times cheaper than that. And you were like, yeah, we should, we could. But you didn't feel comfortable going that route or whatever. I don't know what your reason was. Because you knew well, it. Was, uh yeah, I knew it. I was being a, there's a few things. One, I was a pussy. So I was just, I was being fearful. And number <laughs> two, when I started my company, I was like 24. What I don't, and I never had a job before. What I don't understand is how these young guys, uh, like people who are 21, 22, 23, like when the folks who started box.com, which is an enterprise yeah. cloud company, they were like 20 or 19, like in college still. What I don't understand is when you're a 19, 20, or in my case, I was 24. When I thought about the company, I was like, well, like I don't have any money. I would never buy something that was $2,000. Now that I'm older and I have more experience, I realized, well, $2,000 is not a lot of money. And so what I don't understand is how these young guys who are in their early 20s and don't have a lot of experience, how they even fathom that someone's willing to spend all this money on their product. They're either just courageous or they have more faith. I don't know what it is. But I, but kudos to them because when I was 24 and starting my thing, even though I could have charged way more money, and I tell everyone to do it now, I did not have the courage or the knowledge to do it back then. Right, and you see now because you're inside HubSpot, you see yes. how much companies spend on just stuff, like what amount of money. It's like it's like going to a really wealthy person's house, and then you see them tip. You know, you tip. They tip some guy 100 bucks, or they, you know, they buy this this fancy espresso machine for 8,000 dollars. It's like Oh, these are normal expenses for them. So then when you're on the outside, you're like, I should be charging a lot more. But when you've never been inside one of these big companies, it feels like a $3,000 ask, dude, I better be giving them like my, you know, my left arm. And it's like, actually, they feel more comfortable with larger price tags. And that's like, that, in fact, a $300 product is a little bit off-putting to them and sort of strange to them. Yeah. It's, and it's like disrespectful. It's like, dude, this, <laughs> this thing isn't good. Charge more. Right. So like when, knowing what I know now, and, and I think uh, Mark and Dreesen, ha, like, I forget, like this, it, it, it was a very like headline-y quote, but it was something like if Mark and Dreesen had one advice for his, uh, his startups, it would be simple. Charge uh -huh. more. He right. goes, two words, charge more. And uh, it, because most startups do what I did, you charge way little, uh, way less than you should because you... I don't know. You're trying to be cute. I, I don't know what it is. It, it's just, it's cuter to be cheaper. Uh, but well, it's like it's insecurity, dumb. right? Cause at the beginning you're yeah. like, Oh, I just want some customers. It's not that big of a deal. Then you kind of, then that becomes the anchor point that you mentally anchor to and the market anchors you to. 
And then you're afraid if you raise, raise prices, is everybody going to run out the door? Um, you know, what happens if I raise these prices? I'm going to get complaints. People are going to quit, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's really like a form of insecurity. And it's like a corporate insecurity. And, uh, and so if you're out there, uh, I, I tweeted this the other day. I was like, if you're working at a company, go ask for a raise today. But Do you think but, anyone but, did that? There, there's a cycle. I just got a promotion. Go ask for a raise today. But I'm, I'm, I don't know. I haven't really proven myself. Go ask for a raise today. Everybody should go ask for a raise inside of a big company. Why? Because there's almost always wiggle room. Like, like when I was hiring, they, would, they had what they called a compensation band. What does that mean? It means for the same role, we can pay this much on the low end or this much on the high end. And guess what? You start people low or in the middle of the scale, and then you flex up when you need to. When do you need to? When they ask for more money. And so like, so there's already in your exact role without getting a promotion, there is more money that can be had. The second thing is what's the worst that happens? They say no. And when they say no, you might learn something. They might say no, because like they might give you essentially a soft hell no. What's a soft hell no? A hell no is sort of like they say no. And they, they're like, look, if you want more, you can go elsewhere and get it. That's kind of a, you're not so valued here. Like go for it. Or there's a no that's like, look, we love you. We value you. I would love to give you more. I just can't right now because of X, Y, Z, or can you demonstrate, can you hit these goals? Because that will help us build this case. And Hey, you're one step closer to making more money than you were before you asked. And so, or they say yes. And boom, you get more money. Like there's no, there's no loss. I was, uh, kind except of like if the, you work for me, don't come ask me for more money. That doesn't count because I gave this advice. So don't ask me, but you know, other people, this is for other people. I was notorious at the hustle because when people would ask me for a raise, I'd always say yes. It was, <laughs> I was horrible at confrontation. I just said yes to everything. I'm like, oh my God, I don't feel like dealing with this. That yeah. is not true, dude. You told me a hilarious story. We can bleep this out if you don't want to tell it. I don't know if you remember me, you, and, uh, and our friend Suli, we were at uh, Della Rosa or we were at some, some restaurant. And you told us the story of, okay, bleep this. Do you remember this? It? No. <laughs> I don't remember it fully, but you were just like, um, no, and you can leave <laughs> if you think that. And, and uh -huh. it was just like, it wasn't just no, it was like, you don't understand. Like, you don't oh, understand. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So like the story was no like, <laughs> well, yeah, so I remember this. So I should rephrase this. When people do good, I'm, I say yes to everything. When right. people do bad, they're like, well, I want to raise. So I'm, all right. So you're like, you are a machine to me. <laughs> that sounds horrible, but it's like, <laughs> look, like our business is a machine and like humans are like part of the input. Humans effort are part of the input. Right. And you're asking me for a raise right now. I think that the money that you are paid like breaks even. So like we put money into this, into this machine. Right. We put we input the same amount out and we get the same amount out. If I'm going to give you more amount of money, I'm putting more input. How much bigger is the output going to be? Because right, right now I don't think it's, I don't think that it's worth it. And so... <laughs> I don't think it's worth it. It's and and so if you don't think that that's fair, then you should go to some other machine and figure out where that input can have a bigger output. Because right now it ain't working. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so I love that. I love that because a it was honest. Uh, <laughs> b it was a little bit brutal, and uh, you know it wasn't like. I would say you have many many super strengths like A plus skills. Like I would pick you over anybody. Uh, softly wording. Things is not not one of them, <laughs> so I found it to be super funny. But it, but really, again, even if you find that information out and it hurts in the moment that this person says, "Look, it's not like it's not on the table with the way things are currently at." If you find that out, you know that's a good that's a good piece of information. It hurts in the moment, but it's a good piece of information to know because you might say, "Shit, I need to create more value here." What would it mean? And you can have a conversation. You can say, "Well, what would I be needing to do?" for you to feel great about paying me double what I'm making today? That's a question you can ask. They might not know the answer on top of that, but they'll come up with it. They'll, they'll help work with you on it. And then you'll realize, oh, that's where the value is created in my business. And so maybe in this machine, that's where the machine needs the oil. I should go oil that part of it and create all this new output. And then of course, they'll give me some more because I've created, all, I've created disproportionately more value out of it. And so it's a good conversation to go have if you haven't had it you know, with, with the people you work with.